My name is Guillaume Rawls, and I am the faculty director of the Eastern Technology Leadership Program. It's a great honor for me today to introduce Jim Miller as part of the Eastern's program Leadership Style Series. Jim Miller is the Vice President of Operations at Google. In this role, he is responsible for global operations, planning, supply chain, and new product introduction for Google's IT infrastructure and Google Fiber. Additionally, he has responsibility for Google Energy and corporate and social responsibility. Prior to joining Google in 2010, Jim worked with leading companies in electronics, networking, clean tech, communications technology, manufacturing, and consumer services. What is, really about, uh, what is really impressive about Jim's career is that he always seems to be at the right place at the right time. So consider this. He worked for Intel at the birth of the Pentium. He worked at Amazon.com in the early days of e-commerce. He worked at Cisco when broadband exploded. He worked at First Solar as part of the resurgence in green and solar energy. And now he's at Google right at the development at the forefront of cloud computing. Jim holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Purdue University and a dual master's degree in mechanical engineering and management from MIT. So before giving the mic to Jim, I also wanted to thank everybody who helped put this event together, uh, in particular the Eastern team, as well as our co-sponsors, uh, HTBA and EMA. So without any further ado, let's welcome Jim Miller. All right, whatever I say today is going to be dwarfed by what Guillaume did yesterday. So I don't know if you know this. He was in Boston yesterday running the Boston Marathon. And I asked him, so what was your time? Now the winning time was by an Ethiopian 209. Uh, Guillaume ran a 250, which most elite athletes don't do. <laughs> so his hobby, he's a world-class marathon runner at the top echelon of running, which is incredibly impressive. And now, you know, uh, anyway, anything that will follow is now going to be boring compared to that, I, I suspect. Uh, but thank you very much. It's great to be here. I realize that, that all of my prior experiences with UCLA have been uh, at the Rose Bowl watching football. So uh, this is actually, I called my wife and said, uh, you know, for as many times as I've seen a UCLA football team play, this is actually the first time I've been on campus. So. And I love the fact that I actually can travel here and I don't have to change my watch, uh, which, is, which is usually not, uh, not the case uh, recently. So um, I've been at Google, as Guillaume said, about five years. You know, it's funny, when uh, Google started to recruit me about six plus years ago, uh, I was like incredulous that they actually needed uh, somebody you know, uh, with a worldwide ops title, right? And it was interesting because, like many of you, I was an avid Google consumer of search and, and one of the early customers on Gmail. And I just thought of the cloud as something out there. And I really didn't give a lot of thought to what actually powered the cloud. And this was when we were really secret about what we were doing. And I actually took this job, uh, much to my wife's uh, uh, chagrin, without any job title or, or actually even a job description. Uh, I met Larry and Sergey and, and my boss, he's a Swiss guy, who was Hutzley, he's employee number eight, and I basically took it on a flyer, and, and it's ended up being actually the most interesting jobs that, job that I've ever heard, had, so. All right, um, my intent is, is not to bombard you with slideware today. We're gonna do a high level flyby of, of what the Google infrastructure is and what cloud is and the type of problems that we solve and look at. Um, I, like you, you know, I've got less hair and more gray hair, but I was an MBA student uh, about 22 years ago, sitting where you guys are, you know, at, during a second year, thinking about what I was going to do next. My career took me along a very operation-centric uh, um, uh, path, and, and I'll hopefully be able to share with some of that with you guys today. And then, um, you know, it's an incredibly interesting time to be in technology right now. Now, I've said that candidly every year that I've been in technology, and uh, 
but you know, if you look at, at the explosion of mobile and social and machine learning and cloud computing, this is probably one of the most innovative times in technology on the planet. Uh, and it's only going to get more interesting over the next five to ten years, and hopefully we can talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, hopefully you're going to learn something, and, and hopefully through the interaction I will as well. This is not going to be a Google advertisement. It's not going to be some dissertation on Google. Uh, don't worry about that. And then, um, you know, this is, I'm going to be candid, so these, uh, the opinions expressed are, are my own and don't necessarily represent uh, Google Inc. All right, so you talked about my uh, background. Um, I won't touch on this uh, very much at all, other than the fact that I've had a great career. Uh, somebody asked me, when I, I was back at, at MIT Sloan a few months ago, and somebody asked me to give them a, uh, uh, some comments on, on career management. And I said, don't follow me, because I've had one mantra uh, about managing my own career. And it's working on really cool projects for companies that I really, really admire with people that I love to go and work with every day. And that has been the one consistent theme that has managed or, or been the guiding uh, light of my, uh, of my career. Um, I have a really cool job at Google. Um, it's like no other operations job on the planet. I actually run one of the world's largest energy companies. Uh, Google's got a FERC license, a Federal Energy Regulatory Committee license, and we buy and sell energy as a peer to Southern Cal Edison and the Duke Company and things like that. That's instrumental in terms of how we power Google. We, uh, we consume about as much power as a large metro area. Uh, LA or San Francisco, uh, the, you know, so we, we consume a lot of power on, on an, any given day. And uh, there's this thing called 20% time. Well, the thing that I'm most proud of is I run this thing called, and I started it, uh, Google for Genomics. So we have turned all of our compute capability, and now we're doing uh, cutting edge research on computational oncology and computational genomics. And uh, I had the good fortune of starting that in my, uh, in my 20% time which was actually Sunday afternoon from 1 in the afternoon until 5 p.m. Um, but it's been a, uh, an incredible success. All right, so when Larry and Sergey started the company back in Stanford, it wasn't called Google, it was actually called, these guys are not marketing and sales guys, it was called Backrub. Uh, that was the actual, that was the name. Um, their whole intent was to go and, and really organize all the world's information. And uh, you know, at the time, if you, if you talk to Larry and, and you ask him, you know, did you think that it would actually evolve into this? There were signs of it, but I don't think anybody ever envisioned it to be the company that it is today, even, even Larry and Sergey and Eric. Um, and that's led to some really, really interesting things, like mapping all the world. Now, you know, not only externally, but almost uh, also internally. You can go to almost any museum, art museum in the world, and you can do a virtual tour. And it's really flattened the entire world. Um, we've wired up the planet. Uh, you know, most people think that we actually use other people's fiber optic capability. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon your perspective, Google's about just over 20, 25% of the world's internet capacity. Uh, it, it flows through the Google infrastructure every day. So we couldn't rely on existing infrastructure because it didn't scale with the size of Google. So we had, had, actually had to go off and wire the planet ourselves. Now in the US, that served us very well because we can now build Google Fiber on top of that, gigabit fiber to the home. And we announced that uh, a number of years ago, and that's, that's going uh, swimmingly well. And then we became a hardware company uh, as we got into things like Android and Chrome and Google Glass and wearables and we bought Nest and we'll get into all that as part of the story. So when I joined five years ago and I tell this to Nooglers all the time, you know, the rate at which the company has progressed is really dramatic. When I joined the company, we were a search company just, just over five years ago. We were a search company that had the number two browser, Chrome, behind Explorer. We had this kind of fledgling operating system for phones called Android. And everything else, anything that you see today, X, self-driving cars, uh, Google Life Sciences, any of that stuff, it didn't exist. Or it was just in the uh, ideation mode. And, that's, and, and if you take that rate of change and you project it forward, because we're not going to slow down. If anything, Larry thinks we're moving too slow. 
uh, we're going to continue to evolve the company and, and, and grow the company. And that, that leads to some very interesting business and operational challenges as well. So this is not a forward-looking statement. Please don't go off and tell people that Google's going to be a $300 billion revenue company. But, but this is how you know, I tend, and I being maybe not all of my coworkers, but this is how I tend to look at it. We are, our core business is, is readily approaching $100 billion. And, and you know, the core of the company is ads and search. You know, the large majority of our revenue and the vast majority of our profits, we're still an ads company. But with G-Fiber and we've announced some wireless activity, we're becoming a full-fledged access company. We're, we are competing as much with AT&T and Time Warner and, and Comcast and the other big providers around the world, uh, clearly. And then with our public cloud service, most of you guys are familiar with, or all of you hopefully are familiar with Amazon Web Services. This is actually becoming a, a larger part of Google. We spent $10.9 billion last year on, on data center infrastructure. And the reason that we spent so much is to really, one, compete with Amazon Web Services. And that's actually, by far, the fastest growing part of the business right now. Um, and we'll get, we'll get into that as well. We have this great uh, media company called YouTube. There's the whole disintermediation of TV right now. You guys live it. I'm sure most of you probably watch streaming and YouTube, Netflix, et cetera, et cetera, Hulu. Uh, this is, this, I think, is is one of the most interesting parts of the business right now. Um, you know, we've got a goal to get a billion hours of, on YouTube, and uh, we're well on our way towards, uh, towards doing that uh, on an annual basis. Um, we bought a company called Nest, Tony Fidel's company, and that's become our play around the Internet of Things. And we're seeing that become very, very pervasive, and it's actually growing uh, much faster than most of us thought. We've got play. Android, Chrome, et cetera, et cetera. And then we've got these bold bets over here. A lot of these come out of Google X, um, things like life sciences. So we hired Andy Conrad. Andy ran, was the chief science officer for a company called LabCorp, which is if, most, if any of you have blood tests or go get a physical, most likely um, your, your LabCorp is going to do the processing of, of that uh, tissue or blood. Um, but we're doing some amazing things. We've announced nanoparticles that detect cancer and uh, other things like that, self-driving cars. Um, this is not only the energy company that I run, but also we bought a number of energy companies. Uh, and lo and behold, when Andy Rubin got done with Android, um, he went to Larry and said, hey, I want to create a robotics company. We went off and bought about seven or eight robotics companies. And we now have the largest robotics company in the world. And then we've just announced a $900 million investment in SpaceX. Uh, and that really is about serving um, the internet ubiquitously. So you look at this, and if you're a, a corporate strategist, um, it looks like we're all over the place. And in fact, there was an article um, in the Wall Street Journal a month or so ago. I was on vacation. And I actually get more entertainment reading the comments than I actually read the article. But it was basically saying, you know, one of the, one of the commenters was, was saying, look at you know, Google doesn't know what it wants to be. It's in all of these things. And, you know, they were, they were kind of saying it derisively. And, and I turned to my wife and joked, and I said, that's exactly, that's exactly the strategy. Um, with one common thread of big data and cloud analytics and pervasiveness of the cloud that runs through all of this stuff. Uh, and that'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But this is, and there are a bunch of other things going on. The coolest stuff, like most companies, uh, unfortunately, we can't talk about. But so how big is, is big? And I have to tell you, I am, I, there isn't a month that goes by that I'm not talking to somebody at Google. And, and I literally go, who, who, who buys all this stuff? Who uses all this stuff? Um, it's hard to fathom the scale. Walking into a Google data center, and I'll give you a view of what one of these things looks like, it's very difficult to fathom, even when you're in it day in and day out, the scale at which we operate. So every minute, we up, somebody, you guys, upload 100 hours of video to YouTube. And we have to transcode that, by the way, across 13 to 18 codecs around the world. We have to replicate it. We have to edge cache it if it's a hot video like Gangnam Style. Um, so video, um, I have a 15-year-old. So I actually turn to him always and say, hey, what's, what's the hottest thing on YouTube right now? He's usually spot on. Um, 
Gangnam Style is not the hottest thing on YouTube, by, by the way, right now. I know that. Um, yeah, we've got 500 million plus users of, of YouTube, uh, of, of, sorry, Gmail. Um, our search index is 100 petabytes and growing. So most people, people don't realize this, but for us to actually index the World Wide Web, we copy it. Um, we actually have a copy of the World Wide Web that sits in Google data centers. And as you can imagine, due to uh, disaster recovery reasons, we actually have multiple versions of the World Wide Web in our data centers. You not only are interested in what the World Wide Web looks like today, you're probably interested in what it looked like a week, a month, a year ago. So we actually keep all kinds of cached versions of the World Wide Web. And uh, this leads to some very, very interesting storage problems um, that we have to contend with. And then we design Google around speed and latency. So if you're on a mobile phone, if you're on a browser, on a laptop, or a, or a tablet, you don't want to sit there and wait. And with things like Google Instant Search, um, you actually want everything prefetched to you, and you don't want to notice a noticeable lag. So we have to go build and put data centers and in serving infrastructure very close to where our users are. Um, because again, you don't want to see the latency. And, and one of the things that we consider when we do data center siting and data center design and our network design is the speed of light. Um, because the speed of light, even at distances that we start to look at relative to things like resource and memory sharing, the speed of light makes a big difference. And we talk about uh, microseconds and, and now picoseconds. Uh, so that, you know, again, um, very interesting uh, technology uh, problem. Um, so I think Stephen Levy put it the, uh, the best. Um, you know, we're the mother of all clouds. Um, you know, the, the size and the, the, the amount of infrastructure that we've got uh, is, is really mind boggling. And the best way is not to sit here and describe it, but actually uh, show you what we're up to. So I mentioned this, um, we're, we're expanding all over the place right now. So today, our infrastructure primarily serves our internal customers, YouTube, Gmail, uh, search and ads. Uh, a small piece of it is actually the external cloud. Um, we're finding ourselves competing more and more with Amazon Web Services. The reason we spent $10.9 billion on infrastructure last year, we're going to have a similar type of, uh, of capital outlay this year. Uh, in the next two to five years, the, the external cloud business will actually eclipse uh, the infrastructure that we're using to serve Google Inc. Um, so we will become one of the largest uh, cloud providers on the planet right now. And anybody that Snap, uh, uses Snapchat today, you're actually using the Google infrastructure for Snapchat. Most people don't realize that. This is what a Google data center looks like if you walk into one. And it's kind of boring. It's a raised floor. It's noisy. Um, how many people have been in a data center before? So one thing that you probably realized, was it cold? OK. Google data centers aren't cold. Um, and this, this is, you know, when we started to design data centers, if you walk into any traditional data center, and I've probably been in 100 of them, they're cold. Well, you're wasting all of that energy to basically um, cool the air around you. So when we start, when, and again, um, my boss designed most of the original data centers. And he is a very, very innovative guy. He came out of UC Santa Barbara. He had no business experience. And he found himself building large-scale data centers. And the first thing he asked himself is, why in the world would we want to cool a bunch of air? If we're going to run the world's most efficient data centers, it probably doesn't make sense to make them meat lockers. So we went to Apple, or uh, we went to Intel, and basically said, hey, Intel, we're going to run our chips at slightly out of spec. And Intel, and, and I'm a former Intel guy, the first thing that Intel did was they said, well, we won't sell them to you. We said, fine, we'll go to AMD and buy their chips. And they said, well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> you know, maybe this isn't so bad after all. And the net of it, a lot of back and forth with them, they said, if you're going to run the chips at temperature, you're going to see an increase in failure. And we said, OK, fine, w what's the increase in failure? Now, I know Intel guard bans the heck out of their stuff. They said, well, you might see a 2 or 3% increase in chip failures. Well, everything's redundant at Google. So first of all, we didn't care. Secondly, we didn't think it was 2 to 3%. In fact, it's, it's turned out to be much, much less than that. But we said, look, at the end of the day, who cares? If it's 2 to 3%, 
let's say that that costs Google $5 million a year, and we can save $50 million a year on energy costs, fine. That seems like a great trade-off for us. So that's how we tend to look at things. We look at everything from a mathematical model and a total cost of ownership model, and that really dictates how we run Google and how we design and deploy Google on a daily basis. But that's just one example. These are all designed by Google. They're all built by Google. We actually built, we're the, one of the world's largest server manufacturers that you've never heard of. We built more servers last year than Dell. Uh, we didn't sell any. We won't sell any of these things. These are not pretty. They don't come in nice shiny boxes, uh, but they are some of the fastest servers in the world. This is actually uh, sans moonlighting, I've never seen a data center look like this. Um, this is Hamina, Finland. Uh, this is an old Soviet era paper mill um, that we actually bought. It sits up on the Ar Arctic Circle. It's the only seawater cooled data center in the world. Um, and I ask this question wherever I go Have, Has anybody ever heard of Frazzle Ice? If you're Occasionally a Navy person's heard of it. Um, when we turned this thing on, we have these eight foot uh, diameter turbines that actually suck in seawater from the Arctic uh, Sea, um, the, the pumps automatically stopped. And we couldn't figure out why in the world did this pump stop? And it turns out that when you put seawater near freezing temperature through a pressure drop, it automatically turns into a slushy. And it will freeze a you know, multi-hundred uh, or a multi-ten megawatt turbine fan. As soon as you take the, the, uh, the turbine off, uh, the water solidifies, or it liquefies again. You turn it back on, it solidifies. And this was our first attempt at building a seawater cooled data center. It didn't work. And we had to go back and redesign the, the, uh, the turbine with some very interesting technology that uh, we now use. But this is the only seawater cooled data center. It happens to be the world's most efficient data center uh, as well. OK, um, this is what powers the data center. So this is, the, this is actually the cooling infrastructure that sits underneath or next to a data center. And that little G-bike right there gives you just the scale of, um, of what this infrastructure looks like. Hot air, cool air, it's a big heat exchanging system. And we love to hire nuclear engineers and people out of the Navy because this is the stuff they deal with on a daily basis. And because we're Google, um, we had to, of course, uh, paint the pipes in, in Google colors. Uh, and that's pretty typical uh, at our data centers. This is a old uh, picture of what one of our largest data centers looks like. And this building right here is about four football fields in size. So you can actually see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, 12. And that's another site, that's another site, and there's another site off to the corner that we're actually building out today. So that, that gives you kind of the idea how big these things are. Um, it makes for a good morning run around them. Um, they are miles in diameter. Uh, but again, if you think about it, if you're running fiber optic cable from here to here uh, to do things like load balancing, you have to actually consider the speed of light. Uh, the speed of light and the delay from here to a data center over here, it makes a big difference in terms of how you design one of these things. And it starts to actually impact the actual architecture of the fiber optic network that we build in all, into all of our data centers. Um, again, I don't know how we got the mood lighting in this. Uh, uh, this these are the actual, these are the fans of a server. And again, um, we do some very, very interesting things. You know, designing a data center at Google is, is this interdisciplinary problem of thermal and air and mechanical and electrical. Um, but again, you won't find a Google designed data center anywhere in the world that's, or another data center that's designed like a Google data center. Um, we're heavily vertically integrated. So that means that we actually don't hire traditional construction companies. And, and you'll see we've actually, we manage one of the world's largest or one of the US's largest construction companies because we build our own data centers. But we would rather not educate the rest of the world um, about how to build data centers. And we can debate the merits of that uh, in a second. I alluded to this earlier. Um, we actually, you know, all of these are a pop, uh, a point of presence for part of our networking infrastructure. Uh, so for example, the thing that you do not want to do is if you're watching a, um, a video, you don't, over here in, in Seattle, you don't really want to be serving it out of one of our West Coast data centers. 
we've actually built infrastructure that sits in Comcast and AT&T. There's a, there's a big pop down in LAX uh, that, that Google runs. And we actually serve all of the video primarily out of those data centers or those mini data centers because we don't want to congest our backbone network and our cloud infrastructure with a bunch of video. We want to actually cache it out near where the users are using it. And you like it because you actually see it appear very quickly and serve without jitter or delay. Comcast loves it because it's not clogging their backbone network. We love it because it's not clogging our data centers. And we've got intelligence in all of these little pops to figure out what's the hot video. You can imagine that in Korea, K-pop videos are off the charts. If you're on um, the Midwest, it's probably not a K-pop video. It probably might be, but it's probably something very different. So all parts of the network are intelligent and uh, morph and change as, as the network changes. OK, uh, this, is a, this is actually a fiber optic cable. So we have two ships right now in the world that are lay, laying fiber optic cable. Um, and again, this is kind of Google scale. When I first joined the company, I was on, uh, I was on board for about a week. And somebody brought me a purchase order to buy a Cessna 350. And I said, why am I buying a plane? And they said, um, you know, we, need, we, do, we use it for Street View. We do Google Earth and mapping and things with it. And I said, well, why in the world would, why are we not leasing these things? And they said, we own 20 of these things. Um, we'll use them. And then when they're done, we'll lease them or sell them. And we're done with them. But it makes much more sense for us to buy them, use them, and then resell them. This is the actual Unity fiber. Uh, it connects the. To, oh, it egresses right north of Sendai in Japan, fortunately right north of the, where the earthquake struck, and it actually egresses um, somewhere in LA where, where I can't tell you. Uh, and we built this, and we took 25% of the capacity, and we used it for Google. 25% of it we leased. 25% of it um, we actually keep as, as excess capacity. And then the other 25% is actually dark. And that 25% that we leased uh, pays back this entire cable in not years, but in months or quarters. Uh, so we actually are serving a lot of the traffic for some of our competitors, but it's paying the bills. And this little fiber optic cable is a, is a beautiful um, P&L center for us. Uh, and we've got a number of other of these that sit around the world. So that's kind of when you think about it. Those are the types of things that, you know, hey, let's just go off and let's go build our own fiber optic network. Um, that's not something that most companies have the, uh, the luxury of doing. Uh, but, but our scale dictates and warrants that. OK, this is an example of something called OpenFlow. Uh, so OpenFlow, if, when I was at Cisco, we were, and they still are, um, they are deathly afraid of OpenFlow because OpenFlow is going to do to networking what Linux did to PCs. Uh, it's going to commoditize them. And you know, I see some chuckles out there, and we can debate that. But at the end of the day, this, um, we, you know, we love new technology. And OpenFlow was created at Stanford. There was a Stanford professor. We hired him. I joined app, uh, uh, Google from, from Cisco. I'd been out a few years, and I had no idea that Cisco was actually, or Google was working on an OpenFlow network. The day that the IEEE standard for OpenFlow was announced, we announced that Google was running operationally the largest 100 gigabit uh, OpenFlow network globally. So that the standard had not even been defined, and we had already built and deployed the world's largest OpenFlow network. And as you can imagine, the, the standard's still being solidified right now. We're off to do the next thing. Uh, but that's, you know, we love new technology, and, and we, you know, we love Moore's Law because that powers, uh, powers us. OK, I'll, you know, from a supply chain perspective, the way that we look at, at operating Google is we start with land all the way out to you know, serving capacity. And you know, this is all about we run a real estate company, we run a power company, we run a big construction company. We run a big uh, project supply chain. You know, building, building a Google data center is really akin to building a Dreamliner. Uh, we have the same number of parts for the most part. We've got basically the same global footprint. It all comes together into a big construction project, though, and it never, obviously never leaves the ground, hopefully. Um, and then we have a traditional supply chain sorry, that looks a lot like a Dell, a Cisco, an EMC, um, all wrapped up into one. And, uh, and then we actually use this. Now, the time from 
picking a piece of land to actually serving a search query that makes money is about three to four years long. Um, so one of the things that we're doing, if you're a traditional supply chain person, you build a push-pull boundary. So we went off and bought a lot of land. And we build shells of data centers that sit there empty. And we can now compress a four-year supply chain down to about nine months because we have idle capacity that's already just needs to be populated with servers and racks and networking gear, and we can turn that right up. Because four years out, predicting the growth here is almost impossible. It's very, very difficult to do, even for somebody at our scale. OK, so Google's the world's largest computer. We're the lar world's largest cloud platform. We talked about that already. Um, we run one of the world's largest private telecommunications companies. Um, most people don't realize that. You, to hook these large data centers up, you've got to run a big telecom company. Uh, and we would be certainly up there with the world's largest public tele uh, telecommunications companies. There's a company called Akamai. Uh, Akamai is a content delivery network. It's an edge caching network. Um, we're as big as Akamai, if not bigger. Uh, and I, suggest, I suspect we're bigger. And then we talked about how much traffic goes across the Google network. Um, we're one of the world's largest computer hardware manufacturers that, again, nobody knows about. Um, we just have this massive operation. Uh, I recently was in Korea. I saw the world's largest fab. Uh, it was half operating. Um, Google consumed about a half of that. Apple consumed the other half. We're building flash drives. And they're building iPads and iPods and, and other things and iWatches. Um, and then we run our own energy company, Google Energy LLC. Now that Enron's dead, we're the only FERC licensed private company in the world. Uh, and that allows us to do some very interesting things, which I'll talk about. OK, so that was Google up to about three years ago. And that was the extent of, of what we called operations. And then we announced this thing called Google Fiber. So Google Fiber, and, and again, we can talk about the motivations behind this. Um, I don't think Larry or Sergey ever had the intent of going and building a telecommunications company that would compete with Time Warner and Comcast. Anybody that lives in Finland uh, or Denmark uh, that's in the room, or Korea, when you go to those countries and you use, you use the internet, you realize that the US has a crappy infrastructure. Um, we, for an industrialized country, we have one of the slowest infrastructures in the world. Um, and it's been, you know, this is not a matter of debate uh, as measured by everybody. It, candidly, it's because the AT&Ts, the Comcasts, and other people, Time Warner, they have a stranglehold on everybody. Uh, and you, if you think you've got it bad, go to rural America, it's really bad. Well, we looked at that and said, well, you know, we, we're one of the few companies in the world that can actually create a little competition. So we started this thing called Google Fiber, and we've now announced it in 35 metros. The, you know, is it our intent to go build an, a profitable telecommunications company? It is now. I don't think it was a couple of years ago. But at the end of the day, when we go into a city and announce, announce gigabit fiber, the first thing that AT&T and Comcast do is they basically either drop their cost or the price dramatically, or they announced that in the next few uh, number of, of years, they're going to introduce gigabit fiber as well. Uh, and anybody that's used gigabit fiber, you will be addicted to it um, because downloading you know, a movie in, in 15 seconds is a really pretty cool thing to do. And you will, you know, <laughs> there are enough cat videos in the world to, uh, um, to consume that much infrastructure, but, but that's another whole set of operations. And, Running a customer service company, everybody hates the cable company. Um, you know that's kind of a standing joke. And you know we're building a customer service oriented company, uh, and we're finding some interesting challenges and, and uh, opportunities in that space as well. And then we had all of these other interesting supply chains come on top of it, uh, like Chromecast and our Nexus line of products and. Google Wear and, and uh, the Chromebooks, and we got into same-day shopping as well. Um, you know, so now we are a B2B supply chain. We're a, B2, we're a B2B supply chain. We are an e-tail supply chain. We're a hardware supply chain. We're a consumer electronics supply chain. And one of, the biggest one of the biggest operational challenges that we're figuring out or trying to figure out is what is the, the business case? What's the, uh, the operational models? What are the IT system and tools to um, stitch all this together. Because at Google, one of the things that, you know, Google's not a traditional uh, command and control company. 
uh, if you want to go off and create something at Google, you can do it up to a certain point. So Chromecast, the guys in Chromecast and the team in Chromecast is not going to be told what to do. They're going to go off and go build their own system and capabilities. And um, we'll come back later on and we'll try to optimize it. Because it, at the most important thing at, at Google is moving very quickly and innovating. Um, it's not about running in this, the world's most efficient uh, operation, except in my world. Um, uh, but that's predicated on the amount of money we spend. And then we got into auto, and, and you're going to start to see this come out. Uh, and then we bought Nest, and they bought Dropcam, and then we bought this satellite company called Skybox. So we actually have satellites that, uh, that do uh, high definition, multispectral imaging that are uh, very, very interesting for people that are looking at things like global deforestation. You can imagine having a multiple satellite pass on the Brazilian rainforest, and you can actually watch a field being uh, cut down in you know, a matter of hours. And for a lot of the NGOs that use this, um, they love it. Um, we actually offer it for free. And then we bought this company called Titan, and this is actually drones. Um, and these are large uh, uh, carbon fiber wing drones that we are building to put um, uh, microcells over cities. And then we bought probably one of the most interesting companies on the planet, which is DeepMind. Uh, and we just published this paper uh, a few months ago on this, where uh, this is our, the, really the cornerstone of a lot of what we're doing in AI. Uh, and Demi and the team at Deep Minds, they taught a computer how to play a game. Uh, they actually taught it Asteroids. Um, so if you've ever seen, you know, when you were a kid, if, if you ever played Asteroids, a very kind of simple game. But we actually built this computer, this, this AI machine, and we said, we didn't give it any rules. We just said, watch the game and try to figure out how to play it. And over a matter of a few hours, it taught itself to play, and it actually became so good that it never lost the game. We actually had to turn the machine off before it was defeated. Um, so, and it was all done autonomously by just observing and watching. And uh, machine learning and AI, if you ask Larry and Sergey, are we a search company? They, they won't tell you that we are. They'll tell you our revenue comes from ads and search and our profit, but at the end of the day, we're an artificial intelligence company. Uh, and that's really what we aspire to do. So most of the really cool things that are going on in the company today are around machine learning. So voice recognition, voice synthesis, um, Google Translate, you can hold a sign up in your phone and you, the sign's actually in Russian and you can see it in English or in Chinese or any other language that you choose to. Uh, and that's all done with um, something we call Google Brain, which is our instance of, uh, of machine learning that we've got within the company. And I alluded to this, we bought some interesting companies around, um, around robotics and, uh, you know, for most of us that were around, robotics have been overhyped for decades. Um, you know, there's there's you know, there's a lot of uh, conversation about the future of robotics, and we think the future of robotics is actually around cloud robotics. We, we're not building autonomous vehicles that will operate on their own, um, but they will actually uh, be part of and connected into the cloud, and that's where, where the real intelligence and uh, coordination will occur. And then Google X does a lot of crazy things. This is a contact lens that actually reads blood glucose. And that is a wet lab right there on, in a soft contact. That's actually the antenna. And that's a little photo elect or a uh, uh, electro uh, cell uh, because your tears have saline in them. And you can actually build a battery that sits within a contact lens. And this thing is self-powered. Self-driving cars you guys know about. This is Makani Energy. That's Project Loon, which is balloons. And that's Google Glass. Uh, many of which have been in the, uh, the press lately. So Larry wants to change the world. That's fundamentally what he wants to do. Um, you know, Larry, Larry doesn't think the company is doing fast enough. What motivates Larry is to connect or uh, create and roll out the next big thing. And that really, you know, if you look at it, all the stuff that you see is, is paying the bills for us to go do and create the next uh, great thing. Larry will tell you. You know, when, when I grew up, and I, I'm probably older than, than, than most of you guys, I mean, I grew up during the Apollo era. And the Apollo era was not about exploring the moon. It was about a space race with the Soviet Union. In the absence of, of a race like that, we don't invest enough in science and technology. And we're fortunate enough, Google, 
to invest a lot of money in things that will change the world. And you know, we're lucky. We don't actually think of ourselves as a company. We think of ourselves as Stanford that makes a lot of money. Uh, and we actually joke about that internally. Uh, that's really how we try to run the company, more like an academic institution than a enterprise. Uh, and that's got some interesting challenges at times. All right, so this could be the last slide, then we can go into Q&A. Um, so our operational challenges are really, you know, we want to we run at scale, but we really want to move very, very quickly. Um, we love speed and the, the rapid pace of technology. If you think about it, one of those data centers, if it weren't for Moore's law, that thing would have to scale um, you know, almost asymptotically, um, or geometrically, sorry. The fact that every 18 to 24 months, Moore's law comes, away, uh, comes around and enables a chip, usually from Intel, that performs 2x the amount of work with that same unit of power we are, you know, we're not building Google data centers all over the place because we're tearing out the existing infrastructure and we're putting in new infrastructure. Um, and, you, you know, again, we're evolving and innovating all the time. Um, you know, we, we really think of ourselves as an innovation machine first and foremost. We talked about bold bets and what we're doing with uh, things like uh, software-defined networks. And then this is just your traditional supply chain in, in a lot of regards. Um, we, you know, we're not immune to things like floods in Thailand that constrain the world's hard disk drives. We've got earthquakes. We do a lot of risk mitigation and risk planning. And, and uh, any, anybody that's running a global supply chain today in aerospace, automotive, electronics, even CPG, uh, they all have to contend with these things because that's how the world's uh, working. And then the one interesting thing is we run Google Carbon Neutral. Um, so that was something that we set up day one. Um, that uh, the cornerstone of anything we do uh, is to run the whole company uh, with a carbon neutral environment. And uh, that's a little, you know, we, Google Energy's got about a billion and a half dollars of renewable energy under investment, primarily when we build massive wind farms. So we announced uh, last year, late last year, this uh, data center in Groningen, uh, the Netherlands. And the following week, we announced a multi hundred mega, megawatt wind farm that would actually power the data center. Uh, so for that one, it's coming up almost carbon neutral day one. Uh, but again, uh, that's the cornerstone of, of how we run the operations. Um, all right, so I'll open it up to Q&A, and I think we've got 15 or so minutes. Yes, there's always this moment. Oh, Jim, thank you for that talk. Uh, you talked about, uh, 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 until about five years ago, Google was very much at the forefront of technology, but even more so in the five years that you've been with the company. And today you shared with us the scale at which Google is. What is it that keeps Google uh, a leader in the tech sector? It, what is it doing that's, that's possibly different from uh, the other companies that keeps it there? Um, so the question was, what, what keeps us as a tech leader? A healthy disregard for the impossible. And uh, I'll use a specific example. I, I can't. So when I joined the company, um, we were working on this technology. We, Google, were working on this technology that Silicon Valley entrepreneurs had poured, and VCs had poured hundreds of millions of dollars into. And I, I can't tell you what it is exactly. But I mean, I literally laughed when I saw this thing because I had had friends at Cisco and companies that we had bought and companies that we had, you know, you looked at it and said, it's, it is a quintessential example of that is never going to work. Do you know what kind of people have tried to get that technology to work and they have not been able to get it work, to work? And my boss basically said, um, well, they, they went a very traditional path, and we're going down this very, you know, somewhat nonlinear, atypical path. And in nine months later, literally, I think a, multiple billions of dollars had been poured into companies that were trying to commercialize this technology. In nine months, we had a working prototype. And, you know, not too far late, uh, after that, we actually had not only working prototypes, but we actually were, were installing that uh, in our data centers. And again, um, you know, we didn't do it with hundreds of people. We did it with a core team of six, five, six people. 
And they were, they were good people. They were some of the best people in their field. Um, but you know, we, we, tend to, we, we tend not to look at the past. We tend to look forward. And we set pretty audacious goals for ourselves around energy efficiency. So we have this energy. You know, right now, we're running at a power unit efficiency of about 1.06 to 1.03, um, which means about 13% of the data center uh, energy overhead um, actually powers things that aren't compute uh, related. They're air conditioning and the lights and whatnot. And you know, we have this goal to produce a data center that is less than one PUE. That means that for every piece of energy that goes into it, we're going to actually harvest energy, so it's net zero. I don't know how to do that. That's, to me, that's kind of thermodynamically impossible. Um, but we've got some very interesting ideas about how to do that. So when you set goals, and, and you have to think big, too. I, I remember when we talked about, um, I went to Larry with a proposal to go spend $100 million. And yeah, to me, $100 million is a lot of money. And, and candidly, I, I, my group spends a lot of money. And Larry looked at the proposal for about 20 seconds and just threw it back and said, when your ask is a billion dollars, then I'll know you're thinking big enough. Until then, this is just like a hobby. Don't even come back and do it. Um, so you really, you know, I, I, I think the, um, you know, the, the, you know, there's always these crazy things. Like, for example, you know, the things that are happening in life sciences. And, and I work pretty closely with that group because the genomic stuff, the fact that you're sitting there talking to an oncologist who's one of the best oncologists in the world, who's wearing a Google badge, and he's talking about how nanoparticles are, you know, we're going to track cancer in a body in real time using nanoparticles. And you're sitting there going, you know, I have to go home. I, I can only tell my wife this stuff. And I'm like, you know, I rush home and tell her, you wouldn't believe what happened, or this conversation I had today. And it's just, it's just thinking audaciously about, and, and there's a lot of real science fiction stuff that goes on in the company every day that's like, really? I mean, who in the world would think of that? I mean, I, look, I'm a very traditional you know, ops guy. And, and you know, I'm not on the forefront of all the cutting edges of Google X. I'm, I'm lucky enough to get involved with those things. But um, you, know, you just hire, Google's very fortunate to be able to hire a lot of really great good, solid people, some of which are, are world-leading experts in their particular field and domain. And then you kind of bring that all together. There's this interesting book called The Medici Effect. And if any of you have ever been to um, Florence, Italy, the Medici family back in the 1600s, I believe, 15, 1600s, they brought all of these people together from multiple disciplines, and they stuck them all together. And, and that whole cross-fertilization created some very, very interesting you know, uh, era of the Renaissance. And the Medici effect is alive and well at Google because you can bring a computer scientist together. Um, you know, I'll use my own my genomics work. Bring some of the world's best computer scientists together with some of the people that are leading the world's in machine learning technology. And then somebody who's built an ads inference engine. And then somebody who's a world leading you know, genomicist. And, and you know, we worked. Um, we worked with one of the centers. I can't. I don't think it's public yet, um, so I won't say it. But we we worked with um, um, one of the lead, the world's leading centers uh, in Cambridge, uh, Mass, that uh, sequenced the human genome, and we um, we started our project by asking these guys for five thousand. Two. This was two Christmases ago. Um, we we built a pilot of the infrastructure and, and we came out and said, hey, give us 5,000 whole genome sequences and give us 5,000 solid mass tumor whole genome sequences that are from that person. They might have you know, multiple myeloma or um, uh, lung cancer. And we basically had non-optimized code and we threw it into our inference engine, which is our ads engine, which basically powers all the ads we serve you. It knows, it's the, the thing that knows you and knows you uniquely. And we just said, hey, what's different about these things? And we came up and we said, hey, after about a week of processing time, most of which was actually uploading the genomes, we came out and said, hey, we think we discovered 42 new, new oncogenes. Now, if you're talking to you know, people that are um, that have sequenced the human genome, and they've been looking at these uh, uh, whole genome sequences for years, and they're like, hey, we discovered you know, 40 some odd new proto-oncogenes and oncogenes. Their, their first thing is, there's a bug in your code. And a month later, when they come back and say, wow, you guys discovered 40 some odd new oncogenes, and we're going to write a paper for Nature about that. Um, you know, 
We, the reason that we discovered that, not because we're great oncologists, we're certainly not, but we brought the synthesis, I mean, you know, you go and talk to a scientist, a scientist is an expert in their particular domain. You bring a computer scientist to the table, and it, you know, it could have been any other discipline, but the marriage of computer science and biology, we're now able to solve a very, very unique problem that, that nobody else on the, on the planet is probably able to solve because we have this massive computer that we, you know, we can, you know, if, if we were to go off and sequence the entire planet, we've got enough Google infrastructure to sequence every person on the planet twice in about under 10 seconds. Um, you know, and so we can we can harvest of spare cycles the world's largest supercomputer at any at any moment in time. It's just sitting around idle. Yes, John. We are uh, very thoughtful about leadership, and one of the reasons that Google continues to lead in technology is because of bringing in leaders like you. I expect a lot of the MBAs and undergrads in the audience are thinking about you know the choices they make, the organizations mm -hmm. they go to, and particularly in the tech sector. Yeah, you've had such a breadth of experience leading and also being led by a wide variety of firms. Can you talk a little bit about what undergrads and MBAs ought to be looking for when it comes to leaders that they might think about hiring to hire them? Yeah, we look for passion. Um, so I, I tell this to people all the time. I would be a disaster at Apple. You know, my, my personality is not conducive to, go, to Apple culture. Uh, and I have many friends that have worked there. And, and uh, you know, so I, I tell people, Pick your company, pick your culture um, first. You know, you have, you've got to find a culture that's synonymous with, with your values. Um, pick your, you know, so pick your industry. You've got to be passionate. You've got to go to work every day and, and love it. I mean, I, I'm an aerospace engineer. I, I spent one summer working at Boeing and I realized that I did not want to be an aerospace engineer. Um, and and it, nothing against the aero industry, I, I love it, but I just couldn't go to work every day and, and you know, you know, be kind of one of a number of people designing a widget that sits in a wing assembly and yada, yada, yada. Um, so for me, you know, uh, you know I, I tend to be really you know, hyperactive, so <laughs> that helps. Uh, but I like companies that move very fast and, and the technology that moves fast, so I chose high tech. Um, because I know that the challenges next month are, are not, you know, not going to be, um, are going to be very different. Then I, you know, I, I tend to align myself with companies. And, and what we look for in people, particularly coming out of B school, is um, we we love to see people that really are passionate, that they are entrepreneurial. Now the difference between when I was in grad school in '91 and through '93, and, and what you guys, everybody has a company. I mean, I'm shocked by the number of B-School students that can actually go to school and they, they start at least one company. Um, that's something that, that's incredibly admirable. Um, but we actually look uh, for that because that's something that tells us, you know, you, and we look for people that think outside of the box and are creative. Um, you know, uh, and again, I can say this because I'm a B-School student. I think B-School tends to get, you know, we tend to kind of give it a, a bad word in, in tech. And candidly, um, that's exactly what we need in tech right now, um, because you need that counterbalance of, you know, just you know frenetic energy, and you need some direction. And, and particularly when a company scales, you need processes and things that help a company scale in a managed way. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we we tend to look for for people that are really passionate about what they do and, and that really, really think outside the box. And um, you know, if you have a traditional, if you have a very traditional background, um, we, we tend to screen that out pretty quickly to be, to be candid. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dan Mitchell, uh, first year MBA student here. Thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate the talk today. Um, you mentioned a lot of great companies, a lot of great things that Google is doing. Uh, but what about the things that don't work out so well? What about the instances uh, when a product doesn't do what it needs to do or uh, failures within the company? How does Google address those and uh, learn from those experiences? Well, I can give you examples of that, like Waze. Uh, our, our, you know, our social effort. Um, you know, we can sit here and talk about um, how our social effort Started, failed, fits and starts. How we're, you know, um, we. I think we really foster an environment where 
we encourage that because if people aren't willing to take a risk, if everything was a success, you're not pushing the boundaries. It's as simple as that. So we, we built a culture where we don't look for the victim. Um, we actually look and say, hey, okay, why did this thing fail? Um, and we're, a lot of us are engineers in the company, so we tend to do a lot of postmortems, which are very, um, they're depersonalized. We look at the data. Let's understand what failed in, in the data and try to differentiate that from the people. So we, we look at the, the instances, the circumstances, and we do very, very impersonal postmortems. And that's how we tend to glean things out. Yes? I kind of back I really thought it was interesting the comparison you made when you talked about Google comparing yourselves to kind of Stanford. And uh, I kind of like to flip the script a little bit and think about, um, you know, surely here at universities like Stanford and UCLA, we have that Medici effect. Um, what do you think can be done here to amplify that Medici effect? And what do you think that uh, university research institutions like ours and Stanford can learn from a company like Google? Well, probably share a lot more with their counterparts. I think. Um, you know, there's this publisher perish mentality in, in higher ed. And I don't see, I, I think within the four walls of an institution, there's a fair amount of collaboration. Um, but when it comes to uh, sharing and collaborating across academic institutions, there's not, a, there's not enough of that that needs to go on. And, or that, you know, if you had more sharing across institutions, it would be better. But that said, I understand there's a whole, um, incentive structure around that that, that uh, doesn't create as conducive an environment as that. Yeah. Mr. Miller, thank you for being here today. My name is Amir Ali Um And I've asked this question to, uh, I've pointed this question to many Google representatives before, but I haven't got a concrete answer. Uh, so I was hoping uh, for you uh, to tell me, considering Google's rate and scale of growth, what, strategy or, uh, what strategies are specifically in place to make sure Google products are still welcoming in people's home and are not alienating the co consumer, per se? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, at the end of the day, you know, and, and I'm surprised the EU didn't come up. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time with our customers. And we, at the end of the day, our customers vote with their, with their you know, keystrokes. Um, if they don't want to use Gmail, if they don't use search, you know, for example, we look at search and, and you know, we can look at um, like YouTube for kids. You know, YouTube for kids, um, it had some, you know, backlash about privacy and tracking. I candidly, I don't think any of us really anticipated that. Maybe that, that was, that's being a little naive. Um, but, you know, as soon as we get that feedback and, and the nice thing about it, it's the speed of the internet. When we get it, we course correct very quickly, and we've got more than enough social media and other vehicles to collect information on our, our customers' likes and dislikes very, very quickly. And um, I won't go into the fine tuning that we do with our products, but at the end of the day, we spend a lot of time listening to, to our customers. And, uh, you know, again, I won't go into specifics on that, but we can talk about that later. We, we use a lot of data and a lot of experimentation, a lot of A-B analysis to, to determine that. So I think we're out of time, right? <laughs>